this? Is people singing songs? What's this? The streets are lined with little creatures laughing. Everybody seems so happy. Have I possibly gone daffy? What is this? Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. It's the Christmas star. And that's all that matters tonight. Not bonuses or gifts or turkeys or trees. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. <clears throat> Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Art the herald angels sing Behold, the hope that your heart longs for. Charles Schultz in 1952 did a, kind of drew for us a picture of hope, or the, kind of the battle of hope and hopelessness. And that picture in 1952 that he drew showed up again in 1956. And between 1956 and 1999, Charles Schultz drew a, a cartoon strip with Charlie Brown and Lucy every year but one for 43 years, coming back to the same theme. Some of you know the theme I'm talking about. The theme is Lucy holding a football, holding it up on the ground, and saying, Charlie Brown, trust me. And in every strip, there's a sense that Charlie Brown is torn between the hope, the hope that this time he might kick that football, and the anxiety and fear that he might not, because he knows what people learned through the years as this comic strip unfolded, that on a pretty regular basis, when he got wound up and ready and prepared and ran full speed and went to kick that ball, and we know what Lucy would do? Pull it away. And he'd flip. And the strip ends generally with Charlie Brown flat on his back. Laying there, looking forlorn, looking hopeless, looking distraught. There's this sense that the longing of the human heart is for hope. We want to be hopeful. Charlie Brown, every single time, almost when you're reading the strip, you're like, Charlie Brown, don't trust her. <laughs> She's not going to keep the ball there. You're going to end up on your back again. But, but I love how, how Schultz draws this drawing year after year with, with a sense that for Charlie Brown, there's this ongoing, enduring hope that maybe this time, maybe this time the ball will be there and he'll kick the ball. Here's something that's interesting. It wasn't until, I think it was 1979, when Lucy finally kept the ball there for Charlie Brown. You know what happened? He missed it. <laughs> he kicked her hand instead. And, and there's, this, there's this longing in the human heart. We all hunger for hope, even when things look hopeless. We're all a little bit like Charlie Brown, even though it might look hopeless, even though it might look like it's not going to happen. There's something inside of us that still wants to hope. And I believe with all my heart that the reason we keep running up and trying to kick that football, the reason we keep trying to believe that this time it might work out is that God has hardwired into our soul a longing for hope. Because when hope dies, life tends to die. There's something in us, and I believe it's God-given, that makes us long for hope. And so we, so we try putting our hope in all sorts of things. We put our hope in ourselves. I can overcome this addiction. I believe I can. We put our hope in other people. They'll hold the football. They'll be there for when I need them. We put our trust and our hope in other people. We put our hope in circumstances. We put our hope in governments or political figures. We put our, our hope in athletes or sports teams. We put our hope in circumstances and situations. We even try to put our hope in pastors or churches. And all of these things have something in common. Every one of them at some point will let us down. 
Every one of them. We'll let ourselves down. Other people will let us down. Our sports team will let us down. Can you say a 2 and 10 record? 40, I mean, it's, it's just, there, there, there's some of you like, oh, I can't even hear the sermon now. I'm so distraught. Bring it back, bring it back. But, but, but we have to be, God has made us for hope. God has designed us for hope. And you say, well, if, if everything that we hope in lets us down, then why would God make us that way? Be, because God's doing something more, something bigger than just hope in ourselves or hope in somebody else. For some of you here today, you look at your life and you say, I've put my hope in this circumstance or this person or this financial scheme or this team or whatever it is, this, this life. And, you, and, and you've, like Charlie Brown, you ran hard, you swung your foot to kick it, the ball got pulled away. And for some of you, you're like laying on your back right now just going, I, I, I don't know if I can hope anymore. I feel hopeless and not hopeful. I want to hope, but I don't even know if I should dare. And I want you to know today that God has a message for you. That that longing in your heart to hope in something that can actually endure and last, that's a good thing. But you have to make sure you put your hope where it should go. Your primary hope of your life. It's okay to put some hope in a friend or some hope in a spouse or some hope. It's okay to put hope in people and circumstances, but, but we can't put all our hope there and we can't put the primary hope of our lives and our souls and our futures in those things because we're gonna end up flat on our backs saying, it's hopeless, but it's not. God has a message for us today. Lord Jesus, I pray as we open your word this day, as we think together about the hope that you offer, the hope that you have brought into this world, that you were born to bring, the hope that you are, Lord Jesus, the hope of the world. Will you speak to us today? And I pray a special prayer for those who feel like they're just laying flat on their back, looking up into the sky saying, I don't know if I can hope again. I pray that they would learn to put their hope where it will be satisfied and fulfilled. And then learn to put the right amount of hope in other things, but their primary hope where it belongs in you, O oh God, O oh one who came at Christmas and revealed that you are the hope of this world. Speak to our hearts and draw us near to you this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Behold, behold the hope that your heart longs for. The, the longing of your heart, the, the hope of your heart, that's a good thing to begin with, behold. Pastor Dennis did a great job last week of talking about this word behold. You don't just use behold for everything. You don't have somebody you know, who comes and stays in your, at, at your home and then in the morning you prepare breakfast and you, and you say, behold, cold cereal. <laughs> You're like, ooh. Yeah, it's, 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 it's too much, too much. But, but behold, the hope that your heart longs for. That's worth beholding. That's worth looking. And Christmas time is the revelation of the hope of God. Here's the problem. Here's the dilemma. When we say hope, we often mean wishful thinking. For most of us, when we say hope, what we're talking about usually is wishful thinking. Yeah, I was thinking about going to the beach this afternoon. I hope it stays sunny and warm. Right? Fingers crossed. Hope so. But we're in Monterey, so it might be sunny or it might be foggy. You don't know. But, you, but I, gosh, I hope so. That's what, that's what we oftentimes mean by hope. Uh, we, we can say, uh, I, I travel a lot, so when I get on a plane, if I'm in the back of a plane, and it's always exciting when you're near the back, you feel like an international flight or a long flight, and they'll, they'll come on the, on the thing at the speaker, and they'll tell you what they had, they're, they're going to bring a meal. They say, we have three, three, three options today. We've got a delicious chicken wrap, we've got a lovely pasta dish, then we have a cold liver and vegetable platter. You know, and you're sitting like, you know, in seat 847 in the back, and you're looking just going... Gosh, I hope, <laughs> right? And you're, 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 it's wishful thinking because you're getting cold liver and vegetables. If you're in the, you know, they're, they're going to, I mean, they're, they're always like, I'm sorry, we ran out of the other ones, but we do have this. And that, that's, that's what, we, some of you say this, well, I hope, you know, hoping is wishful thinking. Right? I hope Kevin's sermon's only 15 minutes long. <laughs> that's called wishful thinking. You can hope all you want, right? But, but it, that sometimes our definition of hope is wishful thinking. But now hear this, hear this. Biblical hope, and the passages we're going to look at that deal with hope. Biblical hope is confident expectation and firm assurance. That's biblical hope. I want to, let, I want to read that together. 
Read this with me like you mean it. And if it's new to you, read it like you mean it because it's true. You ready? Biblical hope is confident expectation and firm assurance. That's biblical hope. It's not, gosh, I hope it happens and I'm just, you know, and maybe, maybe not. It is this sense of confident expectation, firm assurance. I, I hope in this as it is my very life. It's based on a God who is present and powerful and a partnership with that God. Very interesting thing about biblical hope is it's this absolute confidence and expectation because of God's presence and God's power, what God has done. But it's also a hope based on our partnership with God. It's not just that God does everything and, and we just kind of, oh, we're just recipients. It's that God works and moves and shows up, but then we also partner with him to live into that which he has promised. It's a partnership. It's God's presence and power, but it's our partnership. When I think about my marriage to Sherry, I don't say this. Hope it works out. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Woo, cross your fingers, you know. Um, no, nobody, I'm a pastor of lots of weddings. Nobody gets married just saying wishful thinking, hope it works. In our world today, people wouldn't bother. But here's the thing. It, it, I, I, I have a hope and a trust because of God's call, because of the covenant he's given to us, and because we work through stuff all the time. I have hope, I have a biblical hope that our marriage is going to endure because when things get tough, we work it out. Even when we don't feel like talking, we talk things through. God's presence and God's power gives me hope, but also my partnership with God helps me live into that hope. And so I can live with a calm and kind of confident assurance that we're going to press on together because I put my hope in God's power and God's presence, but also our partnership with that living God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8 and this amazing, amazing chapter of the Bible, this, this letter that the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago wrote to a church in the city of Rome to the Romans Christians. And in verse 22 of Romans chapter 8, we read these words. And if you have your own Bible uh, and you have a highlighter or something to write with, circle or underline the word hope when it shows up because it shows up a number of times in the second half of the passage. Romans 8, 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. I mean, get that picture? Right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly. There's this longing. Something's happening as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, being part of God's family, children of the living God, the redemption of our bodies. Now listen to this. For in this we hope. For in this hope we were saved. Not wishful thinking, but this firm confidence. In this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we have not yet, for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Something happens in us when we live with hope. We anticipate, we expect, we, we, we prepare, we, we wait, but it's also an active waiting of looking forward to what God has. And, and I love in this passage how it talks about this idea of, of, being, of being children of God through Jesus Christ. And re remember Christmas. Christmas, you know, people, you know, people say, are you ready for Christmas? I'm not ready yet. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't have all the decorations up. I haven't got all, bought all the gifts yet. No, are you ready for Christmas? Oh, yeah. I'm ready to encounter Jesus who's come among us. I'm ready. I got some other things on my to-do list I got to do, but I'm ready for Christmas. What do we mean by being ready for Christmas? We should say, we mean I'm ready to encounter Jesus, to, to walk in the presence of this one who came. God with us, Emmanuel. That God entered human history to save us, to love us, to reveal the love of the Father. That's Christmas. And, and so, so the, this message of hope is one that God breathed into the world when Jesus Christ came. For in this hope we were saved. God's divine design is that God offers hope beyond our wildest dreams. Do you understand that the God of heaven wants you to live in hope? You just have to put your hope in the right things. So you need to put your hopes in the right one, in the right person, in the hope of the world, Jesus Christ, who came among us and who gave his life for us. And if we can put our hope there, then, and, and, and if you say, this is the solid rock of Jesus, and I put my hope in Jesus Christ, as, as, the, as, the, as the great hymn writer wrote, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's my hope. That's what I build it on. Then, when people fulfill your hopes, it's a bonus. When they let you down, you're still okay. Why? Because this is my hope, Right? 
Then when circumstances go great, wonderful. Icing on the cake, baby. But when circumstances don't go great, when your team doesn't do well, when, when your boss doesn't come through with what you thought you were going to get for your bonus or your raise, and you go, oh, now my whole life fell apart. No, why? It hasn't fallen apart. Why? Because my hope is built on Jesus. This is my hope. And then when other things go well, wonderful. Praise the Lord. Rejoice. But when the rest of life goes up and down, you're okay. Because my hope is built here on Jesus. That's the message of Christmas, that hope has entered the world. God's designed us to have hope beyond our wildest dreams. But here's the problem. It's the battle of the soul. Sometimes we're downcast. Sometimes we're hopeful. We go up and down. And the Bible reveals us, the Bible deals with this, that we can even, even in, our, in our life of faith, we can at times feel like there's these, there's these ebbs and flows and ups and downs. And the Psalms reveal this. The book of Psalms are so honest and so pure and just pouring out the human heart. And in Psalm 42 this amazing psalm, we see this journey of hopefulness and struggle, of hopefulness and, and, and worry. Look at verse 8 of Psalm 42. It starts out very hopeful. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me. Man, that just sounds so good. A prayer to the God of my life. Going great, wonderful. Look at verse 9. I say to God my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? But then it changes in the second half of verse 11. Put your hope in God. Put your hope, firm confidence in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This 42nd Psalm written by the sons of Korah, this choral group, this, this family group that would, that would bring worship to God. In verse 1, that's the psalm that begins with, as the deer pants for streams of living water, so my soul pants, longs, thirsts for you, my God. But that's also the psalm in verse 3 that says, my tears are like food. My tears, so many, they're, they're like the food that I partake of. You know? and, and I believe there's a spiritual battle going on. I believe there's a spiritual battle when it comes to hope. Satan, the enemy of your soul. And whether you recognize or not the reality of Satan, Satan is real. And the enemy of your soul wants to steal your hope, wants to destroy your hope, wants to make you hopeless. And the God who made you, made you for hope and wants to breathe hope into you. And so the enemy will keep telling you, put all your attention and all the focus on your hope on those things that somebody can pull out of the way, boom, and you will land right on your back. The enemy will want you to put your hope in the things that aren't worth putting all your hope into. And I'm not saying don't hope in people. I'm not saying people are, that's, that's not a negative thing about people. It's just circumstances. People are going to let us down at times. I've been married for 33 years. I let my wife down sometimes. As much as I love her, you can bank on it. Why? I'm not perfect. Some of you put your hope in your pastor or your church. That's not a solid foundation. Pastors let people down. At some point, if, if you get to know me enough, close enough over time, I will let you down. I will guarantee you. I'm a person. And you know what a church is? It's a collection of people. Churches will let you down. And I've watched people walk away from their faith because a person let them down, a pastor let them down. How can I, I can't even believe in Jesus anymore because that person let me down. And Jesus hasn't changed. Jesus is still the rock. Jesus is still the solid foundation. Jesus is still the one who died on the cross for their sins and they walk away from their faith because this person failed, because this church let them down. Don't put your hope in people, in yourself, in circumstances, in political parties, in political figures, in sports teams, in sports heroes, in TV heroes, in, in, your, in, in your church or in your pastor because all of them have something in common. They will let you down and your hope will be dashed. But put your hope in this God who loves you. Put your hope in this Jesus who came. And that will make all the difference in the world. Behold, the hope your heart longs for is found in Jesus Christ. The one who was born in the manger, who lived a life with no sin, who died on the cross for your sins, in your place. Who rose in glory and broke the back of Satan, hell, and sin. Put your hope there. And then everything else, when it goes well, bonus. But you're not building your life on that. 
You're building your life on Jesus Christ. God offers hope. I want to give you a small sample. Just, I mean, just a little flavor, a little sample. The Bible gives a lot more than this. But when this Christmas season, when you're saying, where do I put my hope? Put it in this God who offers you these things. Hope of everlasting love. One should just love it if somebody would love you all the days of your life. Always love you. Always be there for you. That someone is the God who made you and the God who loves you. Put your hope in him. The hope of cleansing from sin now and forever. You want, you want hope? There is a God who has said that through faith in Jesus Christ, all your sins, past, present, and future, every thought, every word, every action, everything you failed to do, everything you remember, and everything you forgot, he can wash it away in Jesus Christ. Put your hope in that God who promises to cleanse you from all your sins through Jesus' death on the cross. Hope of friendship, a relationship with God. And wouldn't you love to have a friend who was always there for you, who would never let you down? I grew up, and many of you know, I grew up in a home with no Christian faith. I had never read the Bible. I didn't know. I mean, I just no Christian faith. And when I became a Christian, it was all still pretty new to me. I didn't know at the time that God had gifted me as an evangelist. And I love to talk with people about Jesus. So the first probably six months I was a Christian, I talked to every friend I have and everybody I knew, I talked to them about Jesus. And a couple of my friends became Christians. A lot of my friends didn't want to hang around with me anymore. Uh, I wouldn't do the same stuff I did before. I was becoming a different person. I remember being in my bedroom one morning, and it was the summertime, and I just was feeling really lonely. And I prayed, and I said, God, I'm just lonely. Would you give me just one friend, someone who could just be with me I could hang out with? And quietly in my heart, this is what I heard God say to me. He said, I will be that friend. I will be your best friend. And I quietly prayed back to him and said, I want a real friend. I did. <laughs> You're six, I'm 16. I'm like, God, I want someone I can skateboard with. Um, that's, that was actually, the, that was the, I said, God, I want someone. I, I did say that. I said, God, I wish, I, and God said, I'll go skateboarding with you. He did. And he did. And to this day, to this day, the God I worship, the God I serve, the God I preach every chance I get an opportunity, that God is my closest friend. As much as I love my wife, not even close to the friendship I have with Jesus. Jesus makes me be able to love my wife. As much as I love my kids, I love my, my kids like crazy, my sons and now my daughters, but not even close to how much I'm loved by Jesus. He never leaves me. He's always with me. Put your hope in the one who says, I will be your best friend. And then every other friendship becomes a bonus, but that will never leave you. Hope of blessings, good gifts, and an eternal inheritance. Boy, God loves to bless his children. He loves to give you good gifts. And God promises an inheritance that, 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 that the book of 1 Peter says is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you. God has an inheritance waiting for you. And some of that inheritance leaks into this life, and you get a lot of those blessings now. Praise the Lord. But most of it is still waiting for you. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, and it's kept in heaven for you. Put your hope in that. Not, gosh, I hope, but I have a firm expectation and a confident certainty that God has made this promise and it will endure. And that will lead you through this life in the hope that your heart longs for. Hope of resurrection from the grave. That even as Jesus Christ rose from the dead, when this life ends, this life doesn't end, it just begins. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we have the hope of the resurrection. That's Easter. We're talking about Christmas now, but that's Easter. That's the hope. Hope of being in a forever family. You know, don't you wish you could belong in a family of people who love you and who love God? Well, you can through faith in Jesus. And that family isn't just for this lifetime. That family is for eternity. And whether you're gathered here in the worship center or you're online or in the family worship venue, wherever you are at Shoreline, we are part of a family. It's not just for now. It's forever. And even though we send people and there's people leaving to other parts of the country and the world, we will see them again if we have faith in Jesus because we belong to the family of the living God. Hope of heaven with God and his people. Knowing that heaven awaits those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And this is not wishful thinking. This is confident expectation and firm assurance. That's biblical hope. Behold, behold the hope you long for, the hope your heart yearns for is found in Jesus. Put your hope in him and then he will. Let your hopeful moments in other situations and the hopeless moments make sense. 
because your hope is in Jesus Christ. Behold, Jesus offers what your heart longs for. And when Jesus entered human history, hope was born. The hope of God was born, enfleshed, came among us. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. And 1 John chapter 3, and it'll be on the screen as well. Listen to these words of hope. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and listen to this, and what we will be has not yet been known. There's more. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I can't even imagine that day. We'll become like him and we'll see him as he is. And listen to this. All those who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. What does that mean? All those who put their hope in him purify themselves. Putting hope in God is, is, a, is a partnership. We put our hope in his presence and his power and the work of Jesus, but we also follow him to become more like him. So he says, we grow in purity. We grow in Christ-likeness. You want to grow in hope? Put your hope in God, but also follow him and walk with him and become the woman he wants you to be, become. Become the man he wants you to be. Grow in those things that he calls you to be. Grow in holiness in a radically unholy world. Grow in kindness in a mean-spirited world. Grow in compassion in a world that is saying, if you don't agree with me, I have to hate you and you have to hate me. It's insanity where our world is going. But you walk in the hope of Jesus and you can look at somebody who you disagree with and is radically different and say, and yet I can still love you and the power of Jesus. That's world-changing hope. And our world needs to have somebody in this world who can say, we might disagree, but we love each other. We're being told we can't. It's madness. And if Christians don't lead the way in loving people they disagree with, no one's gonna lead the way. And it happens when you know the hope of Jesus so you can become who he wants you to be. Hope transforms who we are and how we live. As we close, I want to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, if not, they'll be on the screen as well. And in Luke chapter 2, there's these two little stories, these two little vignettes of two different people who were hoping, longing for the Messiah, the Savior to come. One's name is Simeon, one's name is Anna. They're kind of right next to each other, and this is a beautiful, beautiful picture. The first one, we meet Simeon in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, he was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him that by the Holy Spirit that he would not die. Get this now. He would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Could you imagine? The Holy Spirit put on his heart. You're going to see the Messiah, the Savior, the long, I mean, waited century after century after century, longing for the Messiah. Simeon, you will see the Messiah. And it happened. Verse 27. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents, this is Mary and Joseph, brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, get this picture in your mind. Here Simeon comes. He sees Mary and Joseph with his baby come in, and the Holy Spirit says, that's the one. That's the Messiah. And Simeon goes, think about this, and takes in his arms God the incarnate, enfleshed God who had spoken the universe into existence. And he holds him in his arms. And, and listen to this prayer. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, may you now dismiss your servant in peace. What's he saying? I could, I could die right now. Because the Savior has come. The Messiah is here. The hope of, he held in his arms the hope of the world. Glorious, amazing truth. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which has been prepared in the sight of all nations. And look at this universal work of God. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. At that time, the whole world was kind of seen in two groups, the Gentiles and the Israelites. So, but this, this baby is the hope for every man, woman, and child of every walk of life in the world. And he held that child in his arms. What a picture. What glory. And then Anna. Verse 36. There was a prophet, Anna, the, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. 
She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. She got married, was married for seven years, and then was a widow until she was 84. She probably got married between 15 and 20 years old, which means she lived 60 to 65 years as a widow. And listen to what she did in that time. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them at that very moment, up to Mary and Joseph and up to the baby Jesus. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking toward the redemption of Jerusalem, the hope of God. I did a little bit of math and figured out that if she'd been waiting 55 years, it was over 20,000 days. You're talking about hope. Over 20,000 days of being in the temple and waiting and waiting. Not just, I hope it happens, but with confident, firm expectation that the Savior would come. And both Simeon and Anna got to behold Jesus. We're on the other side of the manger. We get to see Jesus. He's here. He's with us. He gave his life on the cross. He rose again, and he fills us with his Holy Spirit. He's present, and he's powerful in our lives. So what should we do? We should unwrap and enjoy the gift that you've been waiting for. How do we live with relentless and joy-giving hope? Well, we start by coming to know Jesus. That's the first step. Give your heart to Jesus. Follow Jesus. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, talk with any pastor at Shoreline. Just catch any of us pastors and say, hey, I'd love to have a conversation about knowing who Jesus is. I've got a lot of questions, right? And we'll talk with you. We'll, we'll, we'll jump into a group with you or get you in a class or a Bible study. We'll help you discover and walk. To, we've got a whole series of groups we're starting that are for people who have questions about faith. And we'll get you into a group. But we'll connect with you and walk with you towards Jesus. But it starts by putting your faith in him. If you put your faith in Jesus, then walk in a firm confidence of what he's promised. Declare the truth and hope that you have as a follower of Jesus. And, and here's some things I want to challenge you this, this Christmas season. To declare this, if you are a Christian, declare this with confidence. Heaven is my true home and the door is open. God has opened the way to heaven through Jesus Christ. That is my true home. Put your hope in that. Put your confidence in that. And because of that, because I have a home forever, I can love my neighbors today. It changes how we live today. Hope changes how we live today. Declare this. I am loved eternally. I can have an absolute confidence and hope that I am loved by God eternally. But wait a minute, I'm imperfect. I make mistakes. Absolutely. That's why Jesus died. That's why he rose again. But I am loved eternally by the living God. I put my hope in that. And you know what? It's not because I'm so good, because I know I'm not. It's because he's so good. Amen? Amen? Put your hope in that reality. I am a friend of God, so I can be a friend to others, to sinners, even to my enemies. Declare this with hope. I am a friend of God. God has befriended me. He calls me his friend. Read John chapter 15. God calls you friend if you've come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. I am loved and an important part of God's family. I matter. I am important. You know, Andrew has played cello for us every chance he's gotten since he came here with the military. Now he's going somewhere else. But he's served. He's part of a family, so he uses his gifts. Our people that, that do our technology, our people that work with, with your children or your grandchildren. Right? There's people that serve all around this campus. Why? We are part of a family. We serve God together. I'm part of a family, so I invest in that family. I am forgiven so I can share the message of forgiveness and the hope of Jesus. To say, I know. I, 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 listen closely. We don't, if you're a Christian, we don't say, well, I hope I'm forgiven. Wishful thinking. No. I put my hope in this reality. I am forgiven through Jesus Christ because I came to the cross, I confessed my sins, and he has called me his own. I am forgiven. Heaven is my home. I am a child of God. That's not wishful thinking. I stake my life on it. I put my hope in it. I believe it. And so do you, many of you. And if you don't, his arms are open. If you walk through life, letting yourself or somebody else put the football there and say, go ahead. Oh, lost it. Somebody throw that to me. Come on. Fumble. Dive. Oh, yeah. Dive. Dive. Good. Well thrown. Uh, if, if, you, if you go through life letting all these other kind of transient things become what you put your hope in, you're going to flat on your back just saying it's hopeless. And Satan would delight in that. But this Christmas, will you say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, his love, his life, and his righteousness. 
And then everything else makes sense. Oh God, we pray today that you will help us understand that we can walk in hope, live in hope, a firm conviction, a certainty, a confidence because of what you've done and who you are. And Lord, let that hope transform our lives. This Christmas season, if someone says, are we ready for Christmas? Let us not say, oh, I got more decorations or more shopping. Let us say, yes, I know where my hope is. I know who I believe in and I know who loves me. I'm ready for Christmas every day of my life. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us like that, for coming. And thank you that we can put our trust and our hope in the one who will always be there for us. Let us live out this Christmas with that reality. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.